So, recently, Nintendo has taken three of the best Mario games of all time and shoved them into one nifty collection. So today, I decided to not only share my thoughts on 3D All-Stars, but also go over every other Mario collection to date, starting with Donkey Kong Classics for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Releasing on September 9th, 1988 in the States, this collection contains the NES version of Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. arcade games. But who cares, because you can't play Donkey Kong Jr. math on it. What criminals. Donkey Kong Classics is pretty bare bones for a collection overall. The game essentially contains both of the original ROMs, plus a new title screen to select which game you want. So while it is a nice collection, like I said, it's pretty bare bones in anything else. I do understand though, because for this one, it's on the same console that the games initially appeared on, and also, it's the NES. Would you trust the NES to add extra bonus content when the original games themselves look like this? Yeah, this one gets a pass for me. The next game was really cool for the time, and still is, because that game is Super Mario All-Stars for the Super Nintendo. All-Stars is a really good collection, because not only did it take all the mainline Mario games up to this point and put them on the Super Nintendo, but they also remastered them at that, featuring completely new 16-bit artwork, backgrounds, remastering the music as well, and they also added title theme music for Mario 1 and 2. Also, they added a save system for every game, which is a pretty nice touch. This gave the games the much-needed updates they deserve, especially for Mario 1 and the Lost Levels. Like, if you put the original game and the All-Stars version side by side, I bet at least one person would think that they are two completely different games just because of how much the new background details benefit the overall aesthetic. And for the people who don't know, this is actually the first time the Americans and Europeans got to play the Japan-only Super Mario Bros. 2, known here as The Lost Levels. Some versions of the game even include a slightly updated version of Super Mario World, which mostly updated Luigi's sprites to be distinct from Mario's, as seen here. So yeah, I love this collection, and it is one of the best ways to play all five of these Mario adventures. But what are some of the gripes? Why doesn't everybody play the game this way? Well, for the people who played Mario on the NES as a kid, they would most likely have nostalgia for the original versions, and would prefer going to that version. The next reason is either speedrunners or people who just played the original games first. That reason being that the physics in the games, specifically Mario 1 and the Lost Levels, are a bit off in this collection. It's kind of hard to describe, but if you play the games back to back, you'll definitely notice that they are a bit different. For me personally, it wasn't too hard to get used to, but I can see how others who have played the NES version more often than I have could have a bit of trouble adjusting to the new physics. The final and most important gripe is that while I like some of the new music better than the NES ones, there are a few that stink unfortunately, such as the underground theme in my opinion, which com was completely butchered in the process. Take a listen. I'm sure that there are some people who might like this edition better, I personally do not, and I feel like many others would agree with me when I say that it sounds like nails on a chalkboard. But even with these so-called issues, which I think calling the problems is entirely subjective anyways, I think that Super Mario All-Stars plus Super Mario World is one of the best ways to go back to these games, especially if you never played an old 2D Mario game and just want to get a feel for what they were like. Moving on from Super Mario All-Stars, the next game we have is Super Mario Bros. Deluxe, which came out in 1999 for the Game Boy Color. This game contains the first portable version of the original Super Mario Bros., with various changes such as a world map, a save system, the ability to switch from Mario to Luigi on the fly, extra game modes such as racing a boot to the finish and finding hidden red coins and Yoshi eggs, and a calendar. Yes, this game has a calendar. No wonder the reviews for this is so high. But you know what this video is about, so what else does this have other than a screen that's zoomed in a bit too far for anyone's liking? Well, after earning a total of 300,000 points in Mario 1, Super Mario Bros. for Super Players is unlocked. This mode is just a modified version of Super Mario Bros. 2, and when I mean modified, I mean downgraded. The wind gimmick as well as Luigi's unique physics are now completely gone, meaning some levels had to be altered to actually make certain jumps, and worlds 9 through D, while in the game's files, are impossible to access without hacking. So while this game was impressive at the time, due to massive screen crunch and missing levels of the second game, I would probably stay away from this one if you're looking for a more full Mario experience. 
And while not technically compilations, I thought it would be worth mentioning the Mario Advance series, which takes the remaining 2D console Mario games and brings them to the Game Boy Advance. While heavily inspired by All-Stars, it has a few unique features of its own, such as adding collectible coins to Mario 2 and re-remixing the music. The music isn't terrible, but it sounds pretty compressed coming out of the Game Boy Advance's speakers. At least they fixed the underground theme this time. Probably the coolest game of these re-releases is Super Mario Advance 4 Super Mario Bros. 3, which added e-reader card functionality. Swiping an e-reader card would take you to World E. Each card you swiped would unlock more levels. This was are really cool because it's kind of like a mashup of different Mario games. Like there's one level where you can pick up vegetables from Mario 2, another level where you can fight three boom booms at once, and then you can also use the cape feather from Super Mario World in some levels. Pretty cool stuff. Unfortunately, the majority of these cards were only released in Japan and most people at the time didn't even know what an e-reader was. Due to this, the e-reader didn't sell very well and it's a bit of a pain to track down all the cards to play these levels today. Thankfully though, the Wii U Virtual Console version of the game already has all the levels unlocked and ready to play. Who knew that Wii U would still have something worth playing? Anyways, moving on. Now we've reached the age of Nintendo being lazy. The first compilation in this era is Super Mario All-Stars. This is a really good collection, because not only did they take all the mainline Mario games up at this point and put them on the Super Nintendo, but they also remastered them at that, featuring new 16-bit artwork, backgrounds, remastering the music, as well as adding title theme music for Mario 1 and 2. This is the same collection. Yep, for Mario's 25th anniversary, Nintendo took the ROM of Super Mario All-Stars and stuck it on a Wii disc and called it a day. They didn't even bother to change the controller icon when selecting a game, and they also didn't even include the version of Super Mario World on it. They did nothing but put this on a disc and add a pretty lackluster music CD which could only play one song from each game, and the rest of the disc was just half second sound effects. They also had this history booklet which was pretty cool, but it could have had a bit more effort. Like on the timeline page, after specifically mentioning when the Game Boy came out, they felt to include the Mario Land games here. Also, these developer quotes, while kinda cool, just kinda sound like stock generic things that you could say about any game. Overall, while I like Mario All-Stars, you have to admit that's pretty lazy. And speaking of lazy, new Super Mario Brothers. I think everybody can agree that this series has been one out to death, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about new Super Mario Brothers U plus new Super Luigi U and new Super Mario Brothers U DX. I always find it funny how Nintendo treats New Super Mario Bros. U DX as the first time that they put Mario U and Luigi U into its one collection, when in reality they did the same thing six years prior. The only thing is, there isn't much here to talk about the 2013 release, as it's literally just the two games on one disc plus 222 gameplay videos for some reason. Other than that, the games are identical. DX on the other hand does have changes. Obviously there's Toadette, I think it's pretty apparent that she's an addition to the game. But there's also quality of life upgrades, such as being able to play as characters other than Mario or Luigi when playing single player, adding HD rumble, and giving it native 1080p support rather than the dynamic 1080p support. The rest of those changes are either small changes or obvious switch changes, such as removing boost mode because the switch can't support that, and giving Nabbit more abilities. And others are slightly irritating, such as axing Blue Toad of his character slot. But since most of them are pretty minor, I guess it's time to move on to the game that most people are probably watching for, Super Mario 3D All-Stars. This game came out on September 18th, 2020, and since its release, it has been throwing around names such as good, lazy, convenient, and bad. So what group do I agree with? The answer is yes. While I think Super Mario 3D All-Stars is good and certainly convenient to have on Switch, there are a few problems I have with it. For starters, the decision to quote-unquote fix the camera in 64 and Sunshine wasn't a great one. I'd be fine with it if they had an option to have the old camera, but no, they make it to where you have to throw out years of muscle memory and learn the new camera system. They also could have had put more love into the collection. Like, why would they go through the effort of making Sunshine widescreen but not 64? And also, where is Galaxy 2? Why didn't they make Sunshine have a GameCube controller support because there's literally an adapter right there? Some other Sunshine specific problems is that they didn't even go through the effort to make the emulator hide the debug blocks and the special stages. Like this issue is fully documented by Dolphin years ago, like it wouldn't be that hard for Nintendo to fix. Likewise, it wouldn't have been hard to make Sunshine run at 60fps either. But no, Nintendo wanted to create a quick buck, big Dolphin nostalgia. Also, just the fact that Nintendo decides to make it a limited release to create artificial demand is pretty irritating to some people. One thing that didn't really bother me specifically, but bothered a lot of other people, was that they used the Shinto version of Mario 64. 
While I like doing DLJs, I kinda expected Nintendo to remove it from the game if they ever remade it since, and it wasn't meant to be there in the first place, but I still think it is a bit of a disappointment. I think I've been negative enough with this collection though, so let me reiterate that I do love this collection and I think it's great that we finally get to play these games portably. It's just that this game isn't perfect like all games are of course, but I think personally I'll use 3D All-Stars when I'm on the go and I'll probably stick to the originals when I'm at home, simply because I'm used to playing the games the original way. But with that, I think that about covers all the Mario collections and gives you a bit of insight of my opinions on each game. And with that, thank you all for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Goodbye.